There was a lot of unsettling during the 4th and 5th centuries within the Christian church. And it was one where there was a lot of unification that was placed on the church. The unification of one as opposed to, under one power as opposed to many different factions. And here we find in Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 12, the church of Pergamos. This church was in the middle of a crisis. They had the legions of the Roman government wrapped around them. And they were struggling. Because these legions of Roman empires, or the, the, Roman, the legions of the Roman Empire, were coming and saying, we need unification. You see, the growth and the expansion of the Roman Empire was so vast and so fast that they needed to keep it under one umbrella. But there was factions and there were splinterings that were taking place. These borders stretched from, uh, stretched from the Euphrates River to the shores of the Irish Sea, from Germany to North Africa, from Spain to Egypt. There were all different kinds of people, nationalities, languages, and it all fell under one power, the Roman power. How to keep these people in check. How to keep them in line with Rome's ideas and Rome's thoughts. How to keep them in unity. I'm going to show you this. This is the temple of Serapis. It's actually located in, in Pergamum or Pergamus. And it is in uh, modern day now um, uh, Ber uh, Bergama, which is the capital city or was Pergamum. This, this temple was erected, and I walked through this, um, during the 3rd century B.C. on the orders of Ptolemy I of Egypt. And his orders were this, erect this temple, the Serapis, in order that it may be a symbol of unity between Egypt and Greece. And so they would go there and they would have their conferences and their meets and their greets during this temple phase. It is a ginormous place. And it's really interesting as you walk through the hallways there, there's not really any, any uh, big room, or I should say they're big rooms, just open areas. It's an open aired type of shrine or temple. It's a very fascinating place to go. But the, the, the main key behind this temple was to establish Unification. You see, as the borders of Rome were going, the Hellenistic understandings that the Greek and Alexander the Great were bringing in were starting to crumble and starting to fray on the, just the pure size. So how do you keep the unity? You focus on one aspect that is a unifier, and that's worship. If the Roman government could establish a Roman religion, that the entire Roman nation or empire had to fall and had to worship, they could have unity under that. And so something that was already set up, but not followed through really well yet, was emperor worship. Now we've seen it throughout the other generations or other uh, centuries of the churches. We've seen it happening in the church of Ephesus in that time frame. We've seen it happening in the church of Smyrna and the, and the persecutions that were as a result of that. But now there's, they've got some teeth behind this, this movement of cent uh, centristic worship. This began to form. And Caesar worship was the answer. You see, I think the Church of Pergamum for us today is something that we really need to grab a hold of and understand. Because we are facing a time where pagan doctrines and pagan understandings, society's rules and regulations are coming to the surface and it's something that we have to follow or abide by. Otherwise, we are guilted out of it. We, we have this situation where if, if we are living up to what the standards of the Bible are saying, and we're, we're truly believing that the Word of God is coming from the Word of God, that it is truth, and living by that, we sometimes are viewed as, 
um, absurd, viewed as uh, judgmental, viewed as um, arrogant to believe that there is such a thing called absolute truth, even though it may go in the face of what society deems as tolerant. The Church of Pergamum is a great example of what we're going through today. And Jesus has a specific message for them. So let's, let's read this message. Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this. I'm just going to stop there real quick. I love how Jesus defines himself here. Notice his identifying mark and all the other, or the other two churches are different. He is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the golden lampstands to the church of Ephesus. He's the one who is the first and the last, who is dead and has come to life to the church of Smyrna because of the persecution, and here to the church of compromise. He is identifying himself as the one who has the two-edged sword. The two-edged sword. There's something about this. We, we understand this two-edged sword from many different capacities and many different layers. But Hebrews... Hebrews chapter 4 describes this picture of Jesus more fully. So let's go over there a minute to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, looking at verse 12. The Bible reads, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of the soul and the spirit of both joint and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the attentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. This verse in and of itself parallels Jesus' identity back to the Pergamon church. He says, I am the two-edged sword. He says, I am the one who is the right divider of truth. That my sword, my word, will cut through bone and marrow to penetrate the hardness of a heart. Or the steel resolve of a stubborn mind. It is me who is, who is able to move mountains in order to get to your heart. Now the sword is a fascinating thing because he mentions that it's a two-edged sword. It's not like a battle sword that only has one sharp edge, but it has two sharp edges. And in this example, the sword then becomes not only offensive in nature, but defensive in nature. And Jesus is saying, listen, as you're going through your life, my identity through the compromising church, as you're growing through and going through your life work, that you stand firm. That you don't waver, but that you hold fast to your confession of Jesus Christ. That no matter what comes about our ways, no matter what society says, no, more, no matter what other people are saying is right and wrong, if it's not, thus saith the Lord, you stand firm with me. Because the world seems like it will turn upside down, but I am the rock. And upon me you can stand firm. Upon me is the surety and the promise of my word. There is power in recognizing that this picture is dealing with Jesus. You know, so many times we've talked about it with the 
church of Smyrna, when you go through persecutions and you go through sufferings, that you can lose track of God. That you can lose track and focus all your attention upon the pain and the suffering that you're going through. And in this case, with the church of Pergamos, they're going through it. There was high restrictions that were placed on them that we'll get into. But they didn't let go of Jesus. They held fast. Look at what he says. Going back to Revelation, we'll be going kind of back and forth, so keep your finger there. Revelation chapter 2. Looking at verse 13, he says this. I know where you dwell. Now, we talked about that before. Jesus has an understanding. And that should bring us great hope. He not only knows us physically, mentally. He knows the situations that we're going through. That we're about to embark on. He understands. And he's saying to this church in Pergamum, I know what, where you're living. I know where you inhabit and that this place, in Jesus' own words, he says, where Satan's throne is and you hold fast my name. He's commending them on that. Now think about that. During this time of the fourth century, we know it's compromise. We know there was a lot of gray Great area that was brought into the ranks of the church during this time frame. And yet, he's commending this church that they held fast. Even though they lived where Satan's throne was at. And did not deny my faith, he continues. Even in the days of Antipas, my witness my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. There was persecution there as well. It's a very modeled church of the time frame that we're living in. And stuff like this, when you sit back, goes, that can't happen today. You know, uh, can there really potentially be a one world order? Could there really potentially be a one world faith? Could there really potentially be Yes, there could. It's a funny thing. History always repeats itself. I remember looking back and, and during the time of growing up and, and, and there was a time with the pants when I was younger where your pants, you'd have holes in your pants. And the bigger the holes in your pants, you know, and the more fray it was, the cooler the look, right? And I look back and I was like, boy, that was ridiculous. I can't believe that that was a cool thing. And I look at the jeans today and what are they? There's that little lines and holes in them and there's like the fading and fretting and, and fraying and all those type of things that are happening. I just pray, pray they'd never bring back parachute pants because that was just absolutely horrible. But, you know, it's something, something amazing. History always seems to repeat itself. And so that's why when we lay out and we're reading the scriptures, we should know without a shadow of a doubt, history is going to repeat itself. But Jesus is saying, listen, I will help you. I am there. I am in the center of this. It's about me. And as long as you hold fast your faith to me, as long as you don't let go of me, you will hold fast. You will make it through. You will make it through. I wanted to, before I get too much farther in here, I want to show you a couple other slides on, on Pergamum because there's some pretty good history that is going on here that will kind of help set the stage of even more where we're going at in this, uh, in the sermon. Pergamum, again, is, is the third of the seven churches, and I don't have a pointer, but it's the top, and it's kind of blurry, isn't it? Right underneath the word Asia, there's a little green, well, I shouldn't say that, it's Thyatira. So you look for Asia, and then go to the left, and you will see Pergamum, right over there. It's 55 miles northeast of Ephesus. Everything started in Ephesus. So as the letters were going up from Ephesus, which is right 
the bottom green dot, it goes up there. Okay, that was the third church. Um, Pergamum was a pretty great city. In fact, we would call Pergamum a college town. Had a big university there. And uh, one of the main things behind this university is that it was focused on health and healing. Um, we'll get into more of that. But being part of the university town, college town that it is, it was also said that um, parchment was first used in Pergamum. Parchment was actually derived from the name Pergamum. And there is a magnificent library in Pergamum that holds over 200,000 pieces of literature during this time. Um, it is known for its remarkable learning centers. Refinement in science was huge during this, or in this place, as well as medicine. There was also... Um, uh, something that was known for the, the they were rivaling the uh, the city of Ephesus in temple goddess and god worships. In fact, this is a column. Can't really see it that well. I'm not sure if we could maybe dim these lights back here if that would kind of help. But this column in and of itself right here is a column of Zeus that was still standing in Zeus's temple. And um, very, very, Zeus was a very big uh, god in that area, Athena as well, and, uh, but even more so was um, the god they called Asclepius, Asclepius, and Asclepius was known as the god of healing, therefore they found uh, his temple is right here, and uh, his, this whole healing process was, was actually in a university setting. So we're getting the, the school of medicine. In fact, he has a very well-known symbol that is still used today. You might recognize him. The, the symbols that are used is a serpent uh, on a pole. Or in other words, or over here, the serpent, two serpents intertwining on the poles, representing the medical field. The medical field in and of itself. This is pointing back to Asclepius um, and his studies there. In this area of Pergamum, there are thousands, thousands of uh, um, non-poisonous snakes. And what was said to be, or what was believed was when they would go down, and I don't have a picture of it, but they'd walk down. People from all over the area would come if they were sick, and they would go down into this building. And there'd be snakes all over the place. Now, I couldn't, I couldn't do this. But they would actually lay down in there, and then there's holes that were alongside the walls. And I walked down through there, and there was no snakes when I went through. <laughs> but these different priests that worked at that temple that I just showed you back there, uh, here's another one. This is another portion of the temple. Uh, they would stand at those holes and they'd talk through this long tube that ended up, you know, going into this open room. And they would tell them what to do. So he may, you may have a person that walks in there and they'd say, lay down and put your arm straight out ahead. And then the snakes would come. And supposedly then they were healed. Okay. So... When the people walked down and they would hear the voice, they didn't see the people. They thought that the god Asclepius was talking to them. Uh, so there's this whole, this whole image, this whole superstition that is really wrapped up in Pergamum. In Pergamum. Um, so it should help us then understand why Jesus then, going back to Revelation chapter 2, why Jesus identifies himself with the word, the two-edged sword. Because the people were so filled and uh, surrounded with superstition, they couldn't see straight. And yet, the church was. The church was staying strong through this time frame. Um, 
the, uh, another great text that kind of helps us to understand this, this whole sort of God motif is found in Psalms 139, uh, verse 1 through 4. And I can read that. Psalms 139, 1 through 4, it says this, For the choir director, a psalm of David, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know me when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thought from afar. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down. Isn't that interesting? as opposed to lying down in a temple and allowing unpoisonous snakes to grow on you. And art intimately, and art intimately acquainted with all my ways, even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, thou dost know it all. So the church of Pergamum has Jesus represented as the two-edged sword who knows where they are seated who knows where they are living. They are living in a, an area of emperor worship surrounded by Greek mythology of Zeus and Athena and a skep... Skle, <laughs> well, you know, the Greeks, I tell you, they should have had easier names to be able to pronunciate. Asclepius. <clears throat> um, all these different gods that are surrounding there. And yet they're holding firm. They're standing because God understands. They recognize that. God is all-knowing. He's all-present. And he knows what they're about to go through. So in looking at this throne of Satan, there are many different aspects behind this. And some of the thoughts that have to deal with this is the strongholds of the pagan lifestyles that were, were dealing with emperor worship. Pergamum was also, again, famous, as you've seen before, with the Pillar of Zeus uh, and the Asclepius uh, cults uh, that were bringing people far and near. It was more of a religious center. Um, you can understand, then, where the people would have really rallied up and been really concerned and even appalled at the sight of, of serpent worship when it reminded them as Satan as the serpent in Revelation 12, 9. So that's one aspect. Another aspect that could be viewed as this is that Christians would have called Satan's uh, Pergamum, Satan's throne, because the greatest danger of all. And that came from the emperor worship. Um, emperor worship, again, was centered around theaters. And in this case, Trajan was uh, one of the, the main um, pushes, the main emperors that were going through this time frame. And he liked emperor worship. He believed in it. It was a unifier. And he wanted a unified government. He wanted a unified people. And so he would have many, many different events going on. This is one theater that was set up. And let me tell you what, you do not want to fall because it is so steep. Uh, and it's very fascinating. If you can look and you barely can see it, they have lines that are being cut through uh, on this mountainside over here. It was unfinished. It was going to be huge. They wanted this, this theater to, to surpass the theater of Ephesus. Uh, but they didn't quite get there. They ran out of funding or something. Um, but emperor worship was something that was extremely taxing. Literally. It is something that, that would require their life if need be. This is a, a temple to Trajan. And um, they would come in and kind of lay out what would happen. It would be happening once a year. It was a sacred duty of all the citizens of Pergamum. They would come in once a year. And every citizen of the Providence had to appear before the local magistrates in Pergamum and offer a pinch of incense to represent uh, to a representation of the emperor. So like a bust of the emperor or a statue to the emperor. They had to offer a pinch of incense to him and then they threw it down and it had to say Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. And then once that was finished they were issued a, a, a certificate saying that they have actually accomplished that. If they did not receive the certificate, it was amazing because if they, didn't, if they had a business 
and they weren't able to show that certificate, they couldn't purchase anything. They couldn't sell anything. Does it sound a little familiar? So here Pergamum has a really big picture for us today. What is that certificate going to look like when it comes time for the universal Sunday law mandate? But what, what makes it even more difficult for these Christians that were going through this? What makes it even more is that after they received their certificate, after they showed up at, the, at Caesar's or Trajan's temple, just that one day, they could believe anything they wanted to believe. So all you had to do is just walk in and do Caesar is Lord, throw your pinch of incense, get your certificate, and then you can go off and believe whatever you wanted to believe, just as long as you did that. Now when you look at it from the standpoint of the postmodern society that we live in today, where truth is relative, and, and that really if you wanted to believe that Jesus is represented by, um, I don't know, uh, a chair. That you could believe that. That's okay. You could do that in this, in this time frame that we're living in. But if you come and you say, no, actually Jesus is alive in a well. Jesus is in heaven. Jesus loves us with all of his heart and all of his soul. He gave his life to bring us through so that we can cross the great divide upon his shoulders because he's paid the price for us. And somebody else will come back and say, now, you know what? There's some, that doesn't really matter. I'm glad you believe that, but it doesn't really matter. When I die, I don't care anyway. He's living that environment, living in that setting, all you have to do is show up and pay your taxes to Caesar. That's all you got to do. This is what was going on. And so Jesus commends them and is uh, continuing to commend them that he, they did not deny their faith. They kept their faith in Jesus. And they even witnessed a martyrdom. Now no one really knows who Antipas is. Scholars don't understand who he is. He may have just been someone who, has, who had been influential within the Christian society. But one thing we do know through some tradition about Antipas is that he did receive a martyr's death. And that he was, tradition speaks, that he was placed inside a brazen calf and slowly roasted. So it did make a significant mark on the mind of the Christian people during that time. And he was obviously then killed because he refused to say Caesar is Lord and to pay him tribute. I find it fascinating. I'm anxious when we get to heaven to meet Antipas. Because what an amazing testimony that he had for this church. My witness, he goes on to say in verse 13, speaking of Antipas, my faithful one. My faithful one. Um, verse 14. But I have a few things against you. Now remember, there was only two churches that we have mentioned so far that received only accommodations from Jesus. <clears throat> and no... Um, nothing against them. And that was the church of Smyrna as they were going through their persecutions and the church of Philadelphia. Both of those churches received only praise from the Lord. This one, they were doing it right, but he has some things against this church and this is what he has. Verse 14, but I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold the teaching of Balaam who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block for this before the sons of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. 
so you also have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. So the same issue that was taking place in the church of Ephesus was as well taking place in this church of Pergamum. This group of Gnostic thinkers, this group that has surpassed and have come to this higher plane of intellect, stood up in the local church and began to say, listen, you know, you heard it said, but that's not really what it means. And began to cause some doubt and some confusion. And began to take some of the doctrines that had been established early on in the scriptures and say, you know, you're taking that a little bit too far. And began to water down the process. These, these representatives, these Nicolaitans, the, the members within the own church structure, began to cause doubt. Began to say, hey, listen, you know what? Really? Is it that bad to eat um, an offering to an idol? Is it really that bad? I mean, you know the, the idol doesn't have any thoughts. It's okay. Don't worry about that. When they had received re uh, re uh, very direct instruction not to do that. And just like with Balaam, when he couldn't curse Israel, he had to bless them. He said, the one way you can get to them, Balak, is this. Send your women down there. Throw a party, and they will all be submitted. They will, they will completely turn over and not receive the blessings of God. And that's exactly what happened. So these people were coming in and saying, listen, it's not really a big deal to stand firm in these areas of your, of your walk. It's not really a big deal to, to eat all food offered to, to idols. It's not really a big deal to throw a pinch of incense. You know it. You don't believe Caesar is Lord, but hey, at least that way you can continue to walk through and can continue to, to function in this society. The watering down, the graying of the church's identity, God is addressing. And he's saying, listen, come back to me. I have this against you. Do not, do not go there. The first word he says in the next verse is repent. Turn back. Turn back to where you came from. Church, when I, when I look at what's going on in our church today, and I'm talking world church, there are many different views that are taking place. What seemed so black and white at times through what we've read through Scripture are now being grayed out. They're now different things come into question. Different things that that shouldn't even pop up. And you know, I don't even have to go through and name all those. Because you already know. But this whole dilemma that the Pergamum church was going through, friends, I think we can learn a whole bunch from. And what was their solution to that? Staying firm on Jesus. You know, there are different issues that are going on, whether it's the unification of the churches. And let me tell you, I don't believe in that. I don't believe that there is one such thing as a unified church right now, and I find that through the standpoint of Daniel chapter 2, and I look at the feet. God said that there's going to be a mixing of iron and clay, and they will never cleave one to another. We're going to try History has always told us we're going to try. It's going to, we're going to try to pull things together. In fact, you know, we had one effort with this before was with the euro. And they believe the euro was actually going to uh, get so big to a point that it actually gets into a one system of currency. But the Bible tells me that's not going to work. This whole concept of unification of religion. I have to agree, and this is the slippery slopes, that I think we all can say, 
yes, it is about Jesus and we want to focus on Jesus. But the problem that is coming into is like the same thing the Nicolaitans and the same thing that Balaam was, was getting in and saying that the doctrines, and if I could change the word from doctrines to say the word of God, okay, if the word of God is taken away and watered down, what do you have? That's why it's so important for Jesus to identify himself as the two-edged sword, the sword living, the sword that is able to cut through the marrow, to cut through the mind and able to penetrate the soul because it's the only truth that we have in the world. In this, in this lifetime, it's the only truth. So if we go in on the standpoint of understanding that our unification is solely off of acceptance which I believe we need to be accepting. But allow the doctrines to be decided in heaven, then why have a Bible? Then why have the word of truth? Because it really doesn't matter. The last time I said or looked at the scriptures, it referred to this book and the words in this book in a comparison to Jesus himself or in John chapter 1. The Word was made flesh. We can never get rid of this. I had a friend, believe it or not, I had a friend, uh, a colleague who's in Portland who had a visitor, a guy in his mid-30s, come to his church and say, I'm with the Council of the Unification of Churches in Portland. What will it take to unify your church with us? I want you to think about this. Can we love each other? Absolutely. There's a myth, there's a myth out there that says the Reformation is done. That's an unfortunate myth. There's continued growth through the Word of God because the Bible says it's living, it's not dead, or it hasn't lived. It's continuing to grow. If we stop the process of growing, if we stop the process of loving and growing in the Word of God, we've lost it. The Reformation is continuing. And it's continuing because we have the Word of God. I sat back and, and uh, I shot a, a message over to him and was like, What did you say? He says, I just sat there and listened because I couldn't believe a great controversy was unfolding in my office. <laughs> We're seeing stuff happening. You know, no one knows the day or hour. We understand that, but like we talked about in our Bible marking class today, there are signs and wonders that are taking place. And he's giving us those signs and wonders to allow us to see the nearness of his coming. This is taking place. His church needs to be stirred out of a slumber, just as like the ten virgins. We are dealing with a mighty foe. The adversary, the devil, is so cunning, so wise, so sophisticated. He was able to take a third of the angels from the presence of God himself. Think about that for a minute. Who are we? Who are we that would be able to say, no, I won't be deceived by, by Jesus or by the devil. I won't be deceived by him. We have to be those getting into the word of God that are standing true and if we have taken out and we've walked down some of these paths where these soft-coated understandings of, of the Bible have come into play, where um, the misunderstanding of love has encompassed through the Word of God, the misunderstanding of it, because God is love. His character is love. Every aspect about God is love. But... It's not a wishy-washy love. 
It's not a bubblegum type of love. It's not a love that we see uh, pushed out through the media on these love stories. And it's not these romantic things that we see and we read uh, through novels. It is a godly love. But it's been corrupted. You know, it's, it's hard, and, and at times I sit back and I've heard, I've heard others say, I don't want to hear another story on love. And I struggle with that. So I was like, oh. well, we're talking about God. We're talking about Jesus. He's love. His character is love. I, I can't help but preach a story or preach on love because that's who he is. But I think I'm interpreting what they're saying. We don't want another bubblegum story of love because we serve a sovereign God who is all loving, who is all caring, who is there for us when we're at our lowest and at our highest, who will never leave us nor forsake us. He's not wishy washy, He's not fickle. He's God. And he has a purpose for us. And he has a plan for us. And we can get through it with him. But you can understand a wishy-washy, bubblegum type of religion focused on a love that is, is based off of human thought and reasoning can be fickle, can be wishy-washy. And if we place that upon God, if we place that upon him, all we're going to be focusing on is the relational aspects of connectivity. We need to come together. We need to love. We need to love. But what happens when discord comes in? In that type of a thought. What happens when problems surface? Because the church of Smyrna understood what, the, what, what happens when persecution comes in and what it really means to love. What, what happens if we take a wishy-washy type of love that's fickle and allow discord to come into that? What happens to that love? It goes away. Or even worse, it goes from love to anger. It goes from love to revenge. It goes from love to div divorce. God is a God of love who is firmly established in his word and he wants us to fully recognize that. He wants us to grab a hold of that love and never let it go. But he's not a flash in the pan. And he doesn't require that. What he requires is that we accept him. That we follow him. And that at times, remember we were reading about the Smyrna's as the persecution, and sometimes we go through trials and tribulations because he loves us. If you have a wishy-washy love understanding of God and the persecution comes in, what will you do with that? Walk away? How could you do that to me, God? How could you do that? But our love and that connection with God is firmly established because he says, I love those whom I reprove. I love those. I'm wanting to form them into a disciple that will endure the trials of tribulation that are coming. That will be able to stand before the temple of Trajan and say, I'm not grabbing this pinch of incense and I'm not saying Caesar is Lord. There is only one Lord in heaven and that is Jesus. And that is the only Lord that I will worship and have the strength to go through it. Because a wishy-washy love won't get you through the trials and tribulations that are ahead but a steadfast connection on the love of Jesus Christ. Biblical love. Agape love. That's the love we talk about. So church, we need to talk about the love of God. And every sermon, 
And every gathering and every meeting, we need to always have that reminder that it is God's love that has kept us and it's God's love that is keeping us forward and moving us and guiding us and directing us. It is God's love that is strengthening us through the times of difficulty. It is God's love that is guiding us through the times of being reproved. It is God's love that is steadfast and sure that will not be shaken even at the temples of Trajan. It is God's love that we have. And if we've walked away, if we've had this impression that we got caught up in some of the unification understandings that are focused on a wishy-washy love, Jesus says to repent, to turn a back, turn away from that and come back and follow me because I love you. I don't want you to be confused. I lost a third of my angels in heaven. I don't want to lose you. Turn and follow me. Follow me. Just as Antipas followed me. And as, unfortunately, if there isn't such a change, the Bible goes on to say, Verse 16, therefore repent or else I'm coming to you quickly. I think that is an existential understanding of quickness. That when we look at it, it's going to come quickly upon us because we're not living, we're not accepting, and we're not loving as we should. Therefore, we're blinded. We're blinded by the standpoint of what God has in store for us. And so his coming comes quickly. And I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Notice how he identified himself to this church. The two-edged sword. The word of God. And how he parallels that to Revelation chapter 19. And I have to read it. Revelation chapter 19, you got to come with me there. Revelation chapter 19, this is something that we need to understand because let me tell you what, Jesus is coming for his babies. And I say it from the standpoint like that because we are nothing but children in the eyes of Jesus. And he's coming. And listen to this text. This is a dad who is all done with what the world and Satan has done to his children, starting in verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in the blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Amen. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress with the, of fierce wrath of God and, uh, the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has written a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus is coming. To the church of Pergamum he was saying I am coming. To the church of Pergamum he was saying stay in the word of God. Stay in it because they speak of me. Get to know me. When you get to know me, you'll understand that there's a plan. You'll understand that I have an escape for each and every one of you. You may go through the trials and tribulations, but because I'm a God of love, I have provided a way out. Get to know what the plan is. Read his word because he's coming to claim those. 
who are hurting his babies. And that's the kind of God I want to hear. There's too many times where you hear, Pastor, can you please pray for my brother because he just had found out he's terminal cancer. I'm going to pray, I'm going to pray brother. Brother, or Pastor, would you please pray? Um, my, my sister just renounced being a Christian altogether. I'm going to, I'm going to pray, I promise you. Pastor, will you please pray? My, my uh, mom has just been diagnosed with uh, um, Alzheimer's. I, I, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm going to pray. Pastor, please, would you pray for me? Because I think, I think uh, my husband has colon cancer. I, I promise you we'll be praying. Absolutely. Pastor, are you getting the picture? Satan, or uh, Jesus, as he's looking down upon his children, and he's saying, my word is being completely decimated because of what is going on within the ranks. I'm not going to allow it to take place anymore. I'm coming as the conquering king, and I'm taking my kids back with me. It's done. It's finished. That's the God whom we serve. That's the God whom we love. And that's the God who loves us. He will not leave us nor forsake us through that. But he will encourage us and he will empower us to keep moving forward. In the Bible it says at the very end, to him who overcomes. The Greek word for overcoming is Nikeos. Uh, it's so where they get the Nikes from. It means to be victorious, an overcomer. It means to be triumphant. He's saying to those who overcome, the influx of how the Greek uses that is to is actually should be interpreted as to those who continue to overcome. It's, it's living a daily practice. It's saying, listen, I understand the word of truth. I'm going to listen to the word of truth. And yes, I'm going to run into daily struggles and daily tribulations, but I am going to continue to overcome as they come my way through Jesus Christ. I will and I can through him. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna According to the Jewish tradition, the Ark of the Covenant in which the pot of manna was placed for a memorial was taken by Jeremiah at the destruction of Solomon's temple and hidden in the cleft of Mount Sinai. Uh, it would stay there until the Messiah comes. That's Jewish tradition. At that point in time, the manna then will be recovered as food for the messianic kingdom. And it will happen at that time that the treasury of manna will come down from on high and they will eat of it those years. But in the context, bypassing Jewish tradition a little bit, in the context of where this passage and where this is coming from, it is actually saying that hidden manna symbolizes a preparation in eating of the heavenly manna, the bread of angels, in contrast to eating the food that is sacrificed to these pagan idols. He's saying, you will be able to partake of the bread of angels instead of food that was offered to these pagan idols. And as a result of that, you'll receive a white stone. In the context here, the white stone refers most likely to the tessera. The reward for the victor at the games. It, ha he, it had this little white tablet, had his name written on it. And it, it entitled him to a special honor and privileges, including admission to the public festivals. He just shows his card. This is whom I'm with. Oh, come on in. You're welcome. Revelation 3.11 says this. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have in order that no one takes your crown. 
And the church of compromise, the Lord is saying, hold fast to the word of God. Don't let go of the word of God. So that no one will take your crown. In the age of compromise and uncertainty, we must hold fast to the banner of truth. The word of God is the only sure thing that we have that will guide us into all truth, which is Jesus Christ. So that we will not be carried away by the floods of false doctrine and compromise that are around us. And perseverance, hold fast, Revelation 2, 25, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. One step won't take you very far. You've got to keep on walking. One word won't tell folks who you are. You've got to keep on talking. One inch won't make you very tall. You've got to keep on growing. And one, one deed won't do it all. You've got to keep on going. Perseverance. Steadfast. Refuse compromise. Thus saith the Lord. Love one another. But if there's no testimony in law, there is no light in them. Don't get caught up in this unification mode. Don't think that it's even truthful because it's not what God has. That's not what God's plan is. He loves everyone. He wants everyone engaged. But more importantly, he wants us to lovingly follow him and his word and not the traditions of men. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, we see the signs of the times opening for, before us like a scroll. We see, Father in heaven, that we are living in times of confusion, where even the words that, that demonstrate an understanding of you like love can be confused. The whole concept of natural love between man and woman have been confused. The whole concept, Father in heaven, and the, and the terms and the times that we're living in are becoming confused. And the only way we can have strength, dear Lord, is staying firm in your word. Father in heaven, we need you so badly during this time. We need the Holy Spirit to wrap around each one of us. Let us not take this for granted. Let us not be blinded by compromise. But instead, Lord, open our eyes that we may see. <clears throat> Awaken us up out of any stupor and sleep that we might be in. And let us truly understand the times that we're living in. They're getting closer and closer to your, co your coming. Just as in the days of the thief in the night. Lord, we won't know. But we don't want to be caught off guard. There are so many loved ones, there are so many friends, there are so many, Lord, that we all have our spheres of influence on. Please use us. Please help us to be a beacon of light to them. Let us show them your love. The agape love that only you can give to us. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And I thank you for this family. And Lord Jesus, I'm just asking that your Holy Spirit will hover over each and every one of their homes. And as they depart, their angels are with them. For we truly are on the war field of compromise. Please, we pray, guide us and direct us. We love you and are thankful that you're a God who will never leave us nor forsake us. And so in that, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.